Yeah. 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 This is a little bit of diagnostic stump hitting that we're talking about here. Yeah. And, uh, I was driving a 72 LTD. And this was a very, very long time ago. This was in about, I'm going to say, probably the spring of 1981 or whatever it was. And I was going through the Gulf Oil Refinery and down in Port Arthur, and I hit the gas about the time I went over a railroad track because I was going to hammer down and get some speed up for the road because I cleared the plant and was headed over the intercoastal waterway. And when I hit the gas, it felt like somebody had stuck a potato in the tailpipe. You know? And so I said, what in the world is this? You know, I had seen clogged cats on newer model cars, but this car did not have a catalytic converter on it. Uh, clogged is also a vehicle with no cap. That blew my mind, you know? And so I hit a dead end on that problem for about an hour. I was worked on it down here. And it turned out that this laminated pipe, this is the exhaust pipe that was laminated here, um, actually blew up inside. It broke loose down here. There's some exhaust breached it. So the bottom of that pipe had been flat where it had been hitting the railroad tracks and stuff and all. And it blew a piece of pipe up on the inside of the other pipe. And it was almost completely stopped up the exhaust. And I, I was just mind boggled by that. I had no earthly idea until, so I took it down there to the shop and I cut the pipe here and here when I finally figured out what was going on. I saw those flat pieces on the bottom of the pipe. Cut it off, looked up in there to see what was going on, and I welded some more pipe in there. Now welding a, another piece of pipe in your exhaust is not as easy as it sounds. To begin with, you have to bolt everything up like it's going to go, and then put your pipe in place and tack it, and then set it down and weld it up, and then when you put it back up there, it'll fit. If you just lay it on the floor and weld that pipe in there, it will never fit back up there right, because those pipes won't be right at all. That's like when you're replacing the catalytic converter, the same thing. Uh, and, uh, so when I heavy footed the accelerator, I went from full power to an engine that couldn't hardly breathe. So that took me over an hour there. I would actually took the, I would, when I was working on it, I had it, you know, uh, my hand over the carburetor when I'd rev it up and gas would come up out of the carburetor and hit me on the hand. Because it, the, it was looking for somewhere to go, you know. All right, this was a 2006 Chevy Silverado. Had 116,000. Was had a 4.8 liter engine in it. That's a sort of a mildly underpowered V8. They put in some of these uh, Silverados and all. And it came to us with a low power complaint. And I felt like, well, this guy's pretty perceptive. The guy that was driving it, you know, wasn't no dummy. And he said it just doesn't have the power it used to have. He said it like, you know, sometimes I have to hold more, hold more throttle with one of pills and all that. But if when I drove it, I really didn't feel a lot of anything. To tell you the truth, it seemed to me like it was more or less okay. So, they had an intermittent miss at idle. It kind of stayed with cylinder number four. And, and that miss wasn't spark plug core or injector related. We moved the coils and the plugs around. What you do see is you, if one's skipping on number four and you're thinking, is this a coil or is this a plug or just whatever, you move the coil to another cylinder that's not skipping and see if the skip moves with it. Or the plug or the injector or whatever you feel like may be causing it. If you move that to another cylinder and the, and the skip stays with that cylinder, it's something else other than what you're thinking it was. So oh, there were no misfire codes set ever, but the data stream misfire counter, and you guys have seen that on the scan tool, was counting up misfire. And all that kind of so anyway, we got pulled the upstream oxygen sensor, screwed the fittings out. I mean, uh, we had these little fittings that replaced the oxygen sensor. And that oxygen sensor is an 18 millimeter spark plug thread, like the big spark plug that used to have all some of the straight six boards and all. And we checked the exhaust back pressure in front of the cats with both those little gauges. You're supposed to have less than two PSI in front of the catalytic converter, or behind it for that matter. I guess you could have something stopped up back there. If you've got more than two PSI, we had one that had five PSI, and it was a noticeable power loss, and it had a clogged cap. Um, that, so two PSI is acceptable. We didn't even have a pound. I mean, there was none there. We shot the pipes in front of behind each converter with a forward-looking infrared camera and all. It ought to be hot going. I mean, it ought to be. If you got 200 degrees going in, it ought to be really hot, like you know, 600 degrees going out, or something like that. Didn't see anything there. It's kind of close to the manifold on those light off cats, so it's a little difficult to you know catch that on there too. So, uh, but this fitting right here is the one that screws in where the oxygen sensor goes, and you put your pressure gauge on it and all that. Now, some of the muffler shop people will drill a one-eighth hole 
right in front of the catalytic converter and just hold a, a gauge with a hose on it up there while somebody revs it up. They hold watch the gauge. We've done that here. And if it turns out that it doesn't have back pressure, they just put a pop rivet, a blind pop rivet in that hole, and they stop up that little eight hole they drill. Ain't hurt nothing, really. And we actually found one like that. Here one time we held a gauge up to it and it pegged that sucker out with a 30 pound. Uh, but that one passed the temperature gun test. It didn't seem, it was odd that it had, it, it wasn't hotter in front of the cat than behind it like it is usually when the cat was bad. You know? On this particular truck here, the fuel pressure while driving, we got the fuel pressure gauge, we were gathering all this data here, uh, was a little bit, in, you know, we remained steady at 61 PSI, so we weren't losing fuel pressure when we were accelerating. Fuel trimmed a little out of balance, there's about seven degrees of knock sensor related part retard according to the scan tool screen. That wasn't really the smoking gun we were looking for. The mass airflow reading was like we would have expected in the volumetric efficiency calculation using the chart and the figures didn't really show a lot of anything. Then a compression test, static and running, like we talked about earlier this week, and the number four cylinder only had half the compression that all the other cylinders had. Now that's the smoking gun. We have a breathing problem on that cylinder. That one had issues with the valve train, and we were on our way to finding it. All right. So, one of the guys noticed the valve train activity. He could hear the stuff under one of the valve covers, you know. And he said, "I think there's something going on over here." So we pulled the uh, valve cover off. We got on number four on top of the push rod, and then we basically had a dial indicator set up, and we turned the engine through real slow, and we looked to see how much lift we had. Now you can't hardly get on the valve and do that because there's a little bit of a difference in the movement. If you're right on top of that push rod and you don't have any pressure on it, you can, you can find your cam lift on that. And we were supposed to have 274 according to the specs in the shop manual, we got 243. That told us that the camshaft was rounded off on that load. So what do you do? What's, what's it time to do now? Replace the camshaft. You could replace the camshaft. You wanted to, but it seems to me like pretty good bunch of miles on this. Got a 4.8. Was it only like 116,000? Yeah, let's let's throw a uh, let's throw a 5.3 in there because it's plug and play. Yeah. Upgrade him a little bit. Didn't cost that much more. Time we pull the heads off, got all that stuff done. You know, we wind up spending about as much as we spent putting another motor in it. <laughs> so we put a motor in it. Sure. Yeah. So we. Uh, LKQ says the 5.3 is a really good price and it ran like a rocket sled on rail. This thing was just great when we got through with it. Yeah, I was so happy with it. And, um, that was another engine pretty much like the one we're putting in that Suburban back there for so we get through with it. All right, this Camry noise was lots of fun. Here came to us with a complaint of a noise when turning and accelerating on the driver's side. One of those noises you couldn't duplicate unless you drove it just the right way. And it was going brrrr, you know, sort of a strange kind of a noise. We got that uh, combination right, we get to it every time. And the noise kind of had the characteristics of a CV album with dimple races, but it seemed to me like there were too many. The frequency of the clicking was too much. In other words, I'm used to hearing like dit, 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 dit. when I go around a curve, and this one's going brrrr. <laughs> and it had more, you know, more than I was used to hearing. How many of you guys have heard that? When you turn and the CV axle worn out on the outside and it goes click, 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 click. Yeah, I've heard that. I, you can feel it sometimes. Too, yeah, you can. Yeah. This one here just didn't, to me, it didn't sound like any CV axle I'd ever heard, right? And so it sounded like something making contact with a rotor sheet metal back and plate or something like that. And so we went ahead and used our chassis here. I got the wireless one and I've got the wired one. The wireless one seems to be noisy or something and it's hard to tell what's going on. These right here have got a nice clean sound to them. So I, it's aggravating to put them on, but I like using the wired ones. You, we used this the other day, didn't we, me and uh, Nick. All right, the visual inspection revealed nothing. CV axle boots were in good shape. Here's another thing. When I hear CV axles clicking, I see a busted boot usually. When you look under there, the boot's busted. And you see it, grease dirt. all over the place? Huh? You see yeah, grease slung all over the place. You got dirt and grit up in there. It's been eaten away. Is that thing? Well, we connected the chassis here, the hardwired mics drove it again, sounded even more like something tapping against a piece of tin instead of a CV axle. We ran out of time that day and I told her to bring the car back the next day. Well, we didn't see it the next day. She said, well, I'm going to take it to Toyota place. And they said, well, that's a CV axle and it'll be $800 to change it. Because the CV axle is $500 and it's $200 labor. That's what it was at the dealer. All right, that was a non-starter for a customer. They said, I ain't going there. So 
brought it back. She says, what about a CV axle? I said, well, I'm not opposed to that. I just want to make sure it's one in. I said, I want to try a CV axle from the parts store, pop it in there, put it to rest. And the outboard CV boot wasn't busted. The car only had 92,000 on it. How could it be a CV axle? You know what I'm saying? Not enough miles, no busted boot, nobody's ever been there. Didn't seem to make sense to me. Look at here. Outer joint with boot roll back. They didn't put enough grease in there when they built that thing. What problem was? Now, why did it sound different? Okay, it's got eight balls instead of six, <laughs> so it doesn't have click, 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 click. It had a couple extra clicks in there. You know, they were they were spaced closer together, and that kind of threw me. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was leading me astray on this. You know, I was drawing on past experience, which we have a tendency to do. And one of the things that I absolutely despise is changing out a CV axle and we still got the same noise. I don't want to go there if I can help it, you know what I'm saying? Oh, so, uh, anyway, that's what the, you, know, you can see the little dimples, you see the little dimple right there? Yeah. They weren't very big, but that ball had run there so much with not enough grease, that's the actual CV axle uh, joint. I've got part of it over there. But anyway, it came, it, had, it rolls, and every time those balls, when you're turning, roll across those dimples, it goes click, 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 click. I guess what you're hearing on that. All right, so first thing I told, there's a, was told what I call a part store, there's a part number and a price in the system, but no CV axle for a 2012 Camry is available. And we don't know when we'll ever have one. That sound good to y'all? Yeah. Don't sound good to me, does it to you? I asked if the part store could check with other part stores in town, the same answer came from the other vendors. This story gets better. It gets better. All right. So, Every CV actual parts store sent when they finally were able to find some in, our, in warehouses in Oklahoma and all this kind of deal. We ordered about four different parts pipelines. They didn't fit. See how that one down there is bigger than that one? It ain't going through the hub. All right. So we got a bunch of them. Bunch of CV, every time they sent a CV axle, we'd check it, and it would be too dead gum big. Wouldn't plus, fit. Plus there's something dirty going on. Well, a uh, bottom, uh, bottom 30 okay. spline one, they call, you know, call for a 26 spline, this one was a, 20, was a 30 spline. Yeah, that's a new one. Everything else on that thing, the inside would fit, but the outside was a different size. All right, so could I just change the hub? Maybe I could put a different hub in there to make it work, right? So, we're going to change the hub assembly, make the situation work, and ask the part supplier to get me a hub. He said, you can't get a hub. So I called Toyota. I said, give me a part number on a hub that fits the 2012 Camry. Called the parts store back. Came up with a doorman part number for the hub. Okay. Went online to check out what the doorman part number found out fits in 2004 to 2009. This is a 2012. There's all this picture. Well, I had the parts store give me that hub and a CV axle of a 29 Camry. Didn't even need the hub. The CV axle fits that 2012 just like a glove. Now, I don't know if the parts line has been straightened out since then, but I know I went round and around Robin Hood's barn with this one trying to get it straightened out. That was Booger Bear. All right, so what's wrong with these pictures? Somebody tell me what's wrong with A. Wait, A. The bolt's not even screwed in. The bolt's it. not. And that's a place where somebody said, well, nobody will ever know if I leave this bolt loose. They be eyed. Either that or they forgot it. What about B? That gasket is not He didn't tighten it all going water pump up good enough to even seal it. And whenever he started pouring water there, there's any freeze running everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he told me he was all done. You know, what about having on the bottom? Now the customer's car came in here with that. Hose clamp isn't even on. The hose clamp's on the radiator hose neck, it ain't even on the hose. I wonder if you blow that thing off driving down the road, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Alright, integrity demands you do the job right even when you think nobody will be the wiser. That's what when you when you do what's right even when nobody's looking, you know what I mean? I heard about this one guy, and it's supposed to be a true story. Went to the, uh, Burger King, or no one, it was Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, had, and him and his girlfriend went out to the beach. And when they opened up their book of the chicken, they found a bank bag in there with all of the money from the store's morning. Somebody had stuck it in the Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket and said it over, and somebody grabbed the wrong bucket and passed it to the window. Yeah. So he brought it back. And they said, you brought all this money back. We thought we lost it. He said, well, it wasn't my money. It wouldn't be right to keep it. They said, we're going to call the news, and we're going to have you interview. And he goes, no, don't do that, because this woman I'm with is not my wife. 
Wow. <laughs> he was with somebody else besides his wife, but he wasn't going to steal that money. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He should have just kept the money at that point. I heard somebody tell a story a long time ago. I don't know if it's true. I'd be like, girl, just wait out the car. I'll be like, I got to do this. And then you can Find the problem in this picture. Fuel trims are running at plus 18%. Fuel trims run at plus 18 you got 15 seconds to tell me what you see wrong with this. Everything is so bright, like. Yeah. You can see what's wrong. Is it the hose? The hose? Aha! Yeah. You got it. That hose is disconnected. What does that do? Why does that make the fuel trim go up? Is it oxygen? Because the un well, unmetered air. Yeah. You've got air getting pulled in here that this is not registering, so it's not putting as much gas as it needs, and that's making the oxygen sensors report lean, so it adds fuel to balance it out. You can take the oil filter cap off while it's running, and the PCV system will pull air through there, and it will cause the fuel trims to go wacky. All right, very good. That's a good catch. All right, now, what's being done here? It's a filter. Is that it? Air filter? Or no, that's not an air filter. That's for the condenser. That's your your move. You're getting warm. Uh, is it a plug? We talked about this. You take this out. Pull it out of there. Pull that desiccant bag out of there. That's yeah. the receiver dryer. Put a new one down in there. Put your new plug back in it. Tighten it up. Just figured I'd hit y'all with that. Okay. AC is not cooling. What do you think might be wrong here? Is the clutch hitting that hose line right there? Mm -hmm. Not even. Why? You see anything? Are you even paying attention? You better be. That's all I got to tell you. Yeah. Put on your safety glasses so you can see. Is it rusty? Don't you see all this is burned up? Yeah. Melted out. Garbage coming out of the AC compressor. See that the coil, part. the coil's melted. Oh, well. Yeah, the coil shorted out. That's why I don't like to took it off. That's better looking. Probably what's wrong with that truck. Which one? <laughs> that Ranger. No, the Ranger. The what's it called? Is on that side. Oh, he pulled the compressor off the Ranger and put it back on. That's an easy job, isn't it? Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> back on there and it's leaking, and you're like, what the heck's the problem? Yeah. Well, yeah, he, he put it back on there with the nitrogen, huh? Why was that piece that you put on yesterday under that van that, um... Fuel line? Yeah. Why was that one still looking after you just changed it? Well, actually, it was because those clamps needed to be pinched a little tighter. Oh, that's what it was? Yeah, right, right there where the, where the hose was together. Yeah. Okay, that's what was confusing me yesterday. I yeah. just didn't understand that. All right. Clutch coils don't just open up, they burn out. Got it? Well, that's the Impala story. Uh, AC clutch shorted out, blows the AC clutch fuse after a few minutes. You'll have AC for about three or four minutes, but the amperage eventually gets the AC clutch fuse. Customer dropped by for a diagnosis and an estimate and agrees to bring the car back on Monday. Right. So the car never showed up. Three weeks later, the car shows up with a lot of electrical problems. <laughs> what this guy did is he took some of this 12 2 Romex wire. You know, with the, with the bun, you know, that, that wire there, and they could... And he jumped it. And he told the air conditioner compressor fuse out. He said, I'll get this air conditioner where it'll work, and I won't have to put up with being hot. So he made him a little U-shaped piece of that copper, and he crammed it down in there where the fuse went. Oh, God. And the resulting amplode from the shorty clutch hole destroyed the wire harness. Melted wires together all down in there and all that. This uh, one that came to a shop that a friend of mine owned. And he says... So I checked for around for a wire harness, and what he got from everybody was they ain't one available. You cannot get a wire harness from one of those. And it sounded like a fairly new model car, but there was no wire harness available. Now, I will tell you this. Most of the time, you buy a wire harness from a junkyard, they're not going to unplug the connector. They're just going to go snip, snip, snip. Yeah. You know what I mean? I despise it when they do that. They're going to charge you $150 for the wire harness, and they cut all the connectors off of it. You know, they feel like all you need is the wires. You know, they can put you... But I mean, a lot of times you need the connectors too. One way or another, he declined repairs because my buddy, he says, I'm, I'm going to have to take his wire harness off his car, and I'm going to have to split it open with a razor blade, and I'm going to have to fix every wire that's burned up in his harness, and you will pay me $65, $85 an hour, whatever he charges, 
for every hour it takes me to do this, and it took take me 12 hours. That's pretty fast. Isn't it? Well, I'm telling you, yeah, you're going to be having to, we've had to do that before. When I was in the Ford dealer, sometimes we had to pull a wire on it, all we couldn't get split open, just fix everything that we found wrong in that wire. It's a delay. Yep. Three to remake the one for the Jeep Cherokees, like the that goes into the door yeah. for the like window controls and all that, yeah. all the locks and stuff. It took like three hours to make that. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> anyway, try try using it. Now, the fuse designed to be a weak link in the electrical chain. When the fuse blows, it's easy to change the fuse. When the wire harness burns up, it is not easy to change the wire harness. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more cheap. Nice. Huh? You could buy a thing of fuses for like three bucks. Yeah, you could. But in Palace, it, well, if I was going to do what that knothead did or try to do it, I would put a circuit breaker in there. So it could. He probably was, he wasn't thinking about that. He just wouldn't have burned me out. Well, he didn't, know, he didn't know what a circuit breaker was. He figured out, put some wire in there. I'll have me some say, cool, and I don't even need to get a pick. Well, all he did was make the wire harness a new weak link machine. That is a bad idea. Okay. Now, finding a short circuit. Some hot. Circuit fan out all over the place, like with courtesy lights and engine controls and stuff. There's a short in a system like this. You get a 10 ounce circuit breaker and wire it up like this. Let me grab my circuit breaker. I had one of those for you guys. I'm talking about a circuit breaker like this one right here. Now, don't just grab any circuit breaker. This is a 10 ounce circuit breaker. You can get them with like 8 amps, 6 amps, something like that. If you get too much amperage, you'll wind up doing what the guy on the Impala did. But you want to get like a 10 amp circuit breaker because this usually not going to destroy anything. And you you get some you get a, a light bulb, you wire it in here, and off the other side of this cover circuit breaker, you're going to both sides of the fuse that's blowing. Okay. All right. And then whenever you energize everything and that circuit like over there be blowing the fuse, uh, it'll go dink. The circuit this will and the light bulb will come on. And then the light bulb will go off when the circuit breaker resets. And that light bulb will cycle on and off. Now, if you're working on a courtesy lamp circuit, all you got to do is get in the car and look around and see which courtesy lamp is not coming on. But they're going to come on real dim, all of them that don't have a shorted leg feeding them. And so you say, all right, I'm going to look around in here. That one there is not coming on, and all the rest of them are. So you find the leg that's going to that one, and that's where somebody ran a screw through it or something, where it got pinched by a piece of trim, you know, clip or whatever. Um, so this is a cool little thing and you can buy these, you know. Uh, this one here came from a vendor that comes in here and sells me stuff out of the catalog. And I bought several of these 10 amp circuit breakers for this kind of thing. Uh, but this is like a fuse that will reset itself. It's like it opens up and then it closes back up. And in, in uh, extreme circumstances, whenever we were working, like if, for example, if you're working on one that, they say, it blows my stoplight fuse every three or four days. And you look and look and work and work and work and go through the harness and try uh, to... I heard my friend's truck is doing it right now with his tail lights. Yeah. I mean, it just pops the stoplight and you figure, well, where are they short at? If somebody hadn't put a trailer tow package on it or something like that. I mean, you know, like Scott's lock, they're worried, you know, and you might dig and hunt and poke around and say, why is this happening? You know, because it it, he might be just fine from Monday through Saturday and then Sunday morning pop. Well, like that. We used to actually take and install one of these in that circuit. So that if it was a brief little short, it would open and close right back up and they still have stoplights. If it got to where it was a dead short, this would go ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it would come and go, which is a pretty handy thing. All right, so uh, now then, we're going to show you how you use this in the real world. Um, we got mass airflow code on a 96 Chevy pickup, blows the fuse. Really saw this. This is an actual case study thing that we saw. As soon as you put it in there, you turn on the key, it lights off. Boom. Blows the fuse. All right. So basically, the code we're getting is for this. We're not getting a code for anything but this. Somebody has already put a mass airflow sensor on it. Didn't do a dead gum thing. Still blows the fuse. See, there was no voltage feeding the mass airflow sensor. You might notice that pink wire. You know, GM likes to use pink or pink black wires to carry power to their stuff. I thought I brought my laser with me today, but I don't guess I did. But anyway, the point is, so, how are we going to find this? All right. Disconnect this O2 sensor and move the short. You got that? We had our breaker light tool in there, and while it was blinking on and off, 
we looked at everything on the schematic, and there were several things. We had noticed we had to start from one schematic and go to others to find out where all it went. Anytime you see this, right here, a splice, and this is dotted going over here, you're not, I mean, you're seeing, it's going to another page and it's feeding other stuff you're not looking at. That's why you have to go look over that. Well, we unplugged the oxygen sensor one at a time, and when we got to the one, that one right there, when we unplugged it, that short went away. And that, work, that oxygen sensor had a short adhesion on the inside of it, and it was popping that fuse. You got that? And so our mass airflow sensor code was fixed by replacing an oxygen sensor. See what I mean? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Now we had found other problems on that truck that were unrelated to the to that. I mean, like it had coolant leaks and all that kind of stuff. But that was the last of that. All right. So what do you think? What'd you get today? You take any notes? Yeah, you did, didn't you? You always take notes. The rest of you take notes in here? All right. You, you, whenever you get your final exam, you'll get to use those notes you got in here. He'll get to use the notes he's written down. Oh, yeah. Nice. Okay. You good with that? Are you ready? Revved up and ready? And we're going to start finals a little early in here. So that whenever you get through your finals, if you're not satisfied with your grade, okay. you can fix it. You remember how we did that last time? And... Uh, and uh, he, uh, you turned it into, why don't you got your hoodie on backwards, man? You look strange. <laughs> but, uh, I just did it when I was taking it off. Oh, but anyhow, when you were taking it off, it went up on you backwards? This is, no, you like bring I some strange like things. This. Oh, okay. You I took it. this arm off. Okay. And just, turned it around. Yeah. Oh, he just turned it around. Okay. Like All right, then. <laughs> wow. Well, like my sister, she used to get take her slip off without taking her dress off. I never understood that, you know. <laughs> uh, she had a way of doing yeah, that. Yeah. 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 But anyway, um, we're going to get, uh, well, we're going to get, we're going to get through our finals early, and then you're going to be able to say, okay, I see that I've got this grade on my final, and I see what my final grade is going to be, so what am I going to do to fix this? You'll have some time to redeem yourself. And, uh, and basically, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and go probably through, uh, you know, that first week in August, because uh, I got that thing in uh, Geneva over there, not going to be starting until, you know, when we start back in here. I thought you said it was the fourth. No, not really. That's that's changed now. So you'll get to the. Uh, so you'll get.